Oh my God. My name is Dennis. And I have a problem. No, I'm, I'm not an anonymous alcoholic. And let's make it clear from the start, I'm not even public alcoholic. I nearly don't drink. My problem is different. I'm, I'm a developer. There are a lot of questions without answers in my head. Why do we calculate paddings based on parents' width, even for top and bottom values? I don't know. What to pick? Angular or React? Polymer or Vue? Vanilla GS or Mint GS with chocolate chips? I don't know. Now, when we are writing CSS and JavaScript, is it the time to make it even and start writing JavaScript and HTML and CSS? I don't know. There are many more questions that I have no answer to. Exactly these won't be covered in this talk today. Instead, I want to talk to you about us. Us as human beings, us as developers. We developers are all very different. Some like CSS, others prefer playing with the latest JavaScript framework. Some like aesthetics and hence enjoy skillfully designed websites. Others prefer building unique user experience all the way from the ground. But no matter our differences, there is one thing we all share in common. We all want to be professionally successful in whatever we are doing. And the wish to be successful, to be the best, is not bad at all. This is how evolution works. The problem is that a lot of people take this wish to become successful way too serious. In 1982, physician Robert Goldman posed a question to elite athletes in power and combat sports, asking, if I had a magic drug that would be so fantastic that if you take it once, you would win every competition you would enter from uh, Mr. Olympia to Olympic Decathlon for the next five years. But it would have one minor drawback. It would kill you five years after you took it. Would you still take this pill? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the problem is that more than half of the respondents answered Yes, they would still take this pill. Puzzled with this result, Goldman repeated the same question for the following 13 years until 1995. And during all these years, the results were consistent. People were willing to trade their lives for just five years of success. We developers, of course, are not athletes. Frankly, a lot of us are as far from sports as it possibly could be. Uh, and thankfully, this pill doesn't exist. So we all have to find our own way to professional success. But no matter whether we are different and whether we take different paths, on this path to professional success, we all face the same problems. And exactly about those problems I would like to talk to you today. We'll try to see what those are, we'll try to analyze them, and hopefully we'll try to see what we can do about those. A lot of modern physicists sincerely believe that the world around us is nothing more than just huge computer simulations, so we all live in matrix. So for the purpose of this talk, let's assume this is true. So let's imagine and think how would an average developer could look like in a form of, let's say, a JavaScript program. It all starts here. We are born and raised. And at some point, we get to the first, our, our first milestone as developers. We read our first book. In my case, it was, it's really hard to see here, but in my case, it was Designing with Web Standards by Jeffrey Zeldman, the first edition of this book. You enjoy the book, and you want to apply this new knowledge, so you get into your first project, probably for yourself or for a friend. Probably it was rubbish, and probably you didn't get paid. But you really enjoyed the moment and the idea that you can create something once and it will be instantly available for millions of the users around the world. So you want to go on and you get to your first job as a developer. And things go on and on and on and on until 
something goes wrong. Take a look at the console. The program representing us as developers starts throwing errors. Let's take a look at what those problems are. There are only three here for the purpose of this talk. There are many more, but exactly these three we are going to talk about today. So the first one is perfectionism. Next slide, I will just show you some pictures. I'm not going to say a word. I'm interested in your reaction to those. I will let this one to stay on the screen for a while. Um, of course, this is not a scientific research, but from your reaction, I might consider that some of you consider yourselves perfectionists. I remember in 2013 when a company I was working at back then was about to merge with another company. I had a conversation with my back then boss about how this merge might affect my style of work. Dennis, he said, your style of work is like champagne. It's long processed, well thought, and expensive. The style of a company we are about to merge is more like a Prosecco. It's faster, it's probably cheaper, and probably less quality, lower quality. We both know that, but when both drinks are poured in the glasses at a party, most people won't tell the difference anyway. Even though later this company decided that their front-end works on the unicorn's farting magic and they don't need in-house front-end developer at all, I still remember this dialogue as a good example of how the work of perfectionist and non-perfectionist is perceived by normal people. And yes, I used to think about myself as perfectionist. But whether we want it or not, perfectionists are a completely different breed when it comes to work. Non-perfectionists consider work to be just that, work. When it comes to perfectionists, we consider work a challenge. We consider it as a way of expressing ourselves and challenge ourselves. There is an approach all or nothing in our work. We do not pay attention to deadlines, to any obstacles before we get to this perfect result. Uh, there is no room for mistake in the work of perfectionists. So we do anything we can to avoid even slightest hint to criticism, because criticism is the worst enemy of perfectionists. And when the work is done according to how perfectionists intended it to be, this work can truly shine. So why exactly perfectionism is marked as a bug in our program? Don't get me wrong, perfectionism is really good. Uh, for example, it's great when, um, like, yes, the, the, the problem with perfectionism is that there are two different types of perfectionism according to modern psychology. There is positive perfectionism or healthy perfectionism and there is negative perfectionism. So positive perfectionism is the moving force for, of a lot of industries because it helps you achieve outstanding results in whatever you have passion for. Um, it's wonderful, for example, when your dentist is perfectionist or an architect that built a house you're living in or it, it's really great that Steve Jobs was such a perfectionist that with his attitude to perfectionism, to perfecting the things, he set the bar for the whole industry. But there is a pattern here. Perfectionism is always good when you are a consumer. Believe it or not, when you create things, perfectionism can really stand in your way. The same Steve Jobs as classical example of perfectionists was really hard to work with. In 1977, when he was working on his new Apple II computer, he had to pick the color casing of this computer. And the Pantone company sent him 2,000 shades of beige to pick from. Not two, not 20, not 200. 2,000 shades of beige. None were good enough for Steve Jobs. So he was desperately willing to develop his perfect beige color for his perfect computer. He was so obsessed with this idea that Michael Scott, CEO of Apple back then, had to interfere and stop Jobs from doing that. Uh, negative perfectionism can make people really aggressive when somebody challenges their ideas or the way they work. I will show you a short clip from a sitcom Silicon Valley that most probably you're familiar with, but it nicely illustrates the problem that I'm talking about. I 
Richard, what's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Literally, it's all good. Come on. <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry. Your roommates are right. You really hate spaces. No, 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 no. I don't. It's not hate. Hate's a strong word. Um, truth be told, I do have a slight preference for tabs, but that's only because I'm anal and because I prefer <laughs> precision. Well, not to pick a fight here, but if you really care about precision, wouldn't you use spaces? Mm. But whatever. Once it goes through the compiler, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, technically, yes. I guess, I just, I just don't understand why you, you, anyone would use spaces over tabs. Like, if it's all the same, well, why not just use tabs? Because it could look different on other people's computers. Tabs create smaller file sizes, all right? I, I run a compression company. Trust me, I've devoted my life to minimalizing file sizes. It's what I do. I mean, I do not get why anyone would use spaces over tabs. I mean, why not just use Vim over Emacs? <laughs> I do use Vim over Emacs. Oh, God help us. So, uh, it's funny, right? But... In addition to affecting our personal life, negative perfectionism can have real uh, effect on our work life. And it take, can take different uh, forms in our day-to-day -day job, but uh, we are going to talk about the most common ones. And the first one is called perfectionist paralysis. We all know what is procrastination, aren't we? Uh, the problem is that different people procrastinate due to different reasons. Some are just tired, some want to make the mental shift, but per perfectionists procrastinate because they are waiting for an ideal moment to start working on their ideal project. Well, at least that's how perfectionists think about this process. In reality, perfectionists are just afraid of not achieving perfect result after all. It's the fear of failure. They try to think about not existing problems in every task they're working with. This overcomplicates uh, over even slight, even smallest tasks, and naturally enough, perfectionists need some time and some strength to fight this huge monster that eats their time and resources. But let's assume that, in reality, this ideal moment never comes before it's too late, right? But let's assume that miracles happen and you've got your ideal moment, so you start working on the project. I'm sorry, on a project. Or simply a deadline is knocking at your door and you have to start. So you start this and then you get into the next problem of negative perfectionism. That is called picking a detail. So the wish to finish every task perfectionist works with, necessarily with perfect result, leads them to pick really small tasks that they would be guaranteed to finish with perfect result. But while working with these small tasks, Perfectionists dive so deep in this task that they completely lose overview of a project that still lives around this small task. Again, let's assume that you have perfect project manager who is familiar with your style and reminds you from time to time about delivering the result. So at some point you're ready. You're ready to deliver your feature, your project, your application, whatever. And you get to the next problem of negative perfectionism. That is called unnecessary task, or as I call it, a cherry on top. The moment you're ready to deliver your feature, your project, your application, whatever, an evil idea comes to your mind. Hmm, this thing might be improved a bit. And you start with just taking a look. And another evil idea comes to your mind. Hmm, this is not hard. Shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes. Nah. And you dive deeper and deeper and deeper, and at the end you spend the whole day for something that at best doesn't bring value to the project. At worst, you run git reset hard because this feature works unpredictable, unpredictably, I'm sorry, or just ruins the whole project. And only then you realize how stupid this day was. So we see that negative perfectionism brings a lot of troubles into our lives, into the lives of those we are working with and those who dare to live with us. But what is the solution? A lot of resources advise to just stop being a perfectionist. This is much easier to say than to do. My solution is 
to convert this obsession-driven negative perfectionism into the positive perfectionism. How we can achieve this? Let's get straight into the examples. Let me tell you a story. By the age of 40, before establishing one of the most profitable and well-known companies in the world, Henry Ford had established two other car companies and failed with both. Moreover, the management of the second company had to push Ford off the company just four months after he established it. A lot of resources attribute these failures to Ford's craving for perfectionism. Uh, according to the story of the second comp car company that is now called Cadillac, Ford was constantly working on perfecting the designs of the cars, completely ignoring deadlines and postponing production of the real car. But no matter his craving for perfectionism, the first cars of his third company that now is known as Ford Motor Company were just on par with the competitors. Neither better nor worse. They were just average cars. Because of this, Ford insisted on postponing production of the cars before they get perfected. At this moment, the investors had enough of Ford and insisted on implementing the paradigm make sale now, fix them later. Had it been not to the healthy attitude to perfectionism from the investors of the Ford, uh, the world might have never heard of Henry Ford. He would just push his third company off the bridge as he did two times before that. But let's take a look at the difference between negative and positive perfectionism in our industry. Let's consider two statements. The first one, my product should be perfect. I'm not going to release, develop a feature, commit before I'm sure it is perfect. And the second one, my product should be perfect. And this release feature commit moves me one step closer to this perfect result. With this example, it's really easy to, see the, to notice the difference between unhealthy and healthy attitude to perfectionism and see how the negative perfectionism really blocks us when we create things. We have to accept, we have to learn ourselves to get to this positive attitude to perfectionism. We have to accept that our products can live in any version, alpha, beta, 0 0.1, anything. They should not be perfect from day one. They might be even incomplete. Uh, Jim Bouchard, author and motivational speaker, tells this about perfectionism. Perfection is not a destination. It's a never-ending process. Enjoy. Because if we do not convert into the positive perfectionists, we tend to grasp all the information we have in our industry in order to just understand what is perfect and what is not. And then we tend to fall into the next bug of our program. That is called imposter phenomenon. I bet some of you are sitting and asking, what phenomenon? And would be right. Until recently, this topic has not been really covered in our industry. But scientific research shows that two out of five successful people constantly suffer from it. And up to 70% of the general population has experienced this problem at least dur during at least one period of their professional career. So let me give you three statements and then I will ask you to raise your hands. Let's start with the first statement. You think that your success in something is due to luck, timing, or any other third-party power, not your hard working, your intelligence, or your talent. The first one. The second one. You think that others might discover that you are not as skilled as they think you are. Wait a second, wait a second, wait, wait, wait for it. The third one, you think that others are more intelligent than you are. And now it's your time. Who can say that at least something on this list applies to them? Wonderful. Take a look. Keep, keep the hands. Just like those in the front. Take a look. Like almost the whole audience. Welcome. Welcome to the Club of Imposters. And let me congratulate you, because we are all in a really good company. You think, why would anyone want to see me again in the movie? And I don't know how to act anyway, so why am I doing this? Meryl Streep, actress, 
389 nominations, 156 wins, three Oscars as Best Actress. I always feel like something of an imposter. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a writer. I've been fooling myself and other people. John Steinbeck, a writer. 27 books, Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, Nobel Prize in Literature. I still doubt myself every single day. What people believe is my self-confidence is actually my reaction to fear. Will Smith, actor, musician. Six American Music Awards, four Grammys, two Oscar nominations as Best Actor. So technically, imposter phenomenon is the inability to internalize your own achievements. That leads you to the feeling that you are less competent than the rest of the world believes you to be. The term imposter phenomenon, when I first heard about it, I had my wow moment because I didn't even know that the feelings I had had a name, but it, they had a quite established name. The term imposter phenomenon first appeared in the scientific from 1978 dedicated to high-achieving women in academics. That's true. For many years, scientific community believed that this phenomenon is highly confined to high-achieving women. But the very same scientists now believe that this feeling, the feeling of being fraud, is much more universal and it might be even more problematic for men. Because naturally, it's much harder for men to confess things like insecurity and incompetence. Hence, men end up hiding their fears, being unable to unburden them and seek help. When we do not pay attention to our imposter syndrome, what can happen? From simple psychological discomfort that insecurity brings, it can lead us straight to failure. Only a couple of years ago, I had several applications of to read functionality in my portable devices, like uh, pocket, uh, flipboard, Instapaper. And I was sending, uh, saving all the news, all the interesting things in our, in our community, right? Then there were um, magazines, Smashing Magazine, A List Apart, Net Magazine. Those constantly brought me the latest how-tos and tutorials and news, from, uh, like interesting articles from the world of development, from the, from the web development. Then we have Twitter. Reading Twitter might be depressive on its own because seeing so many talented people bragging about their achievements and their success doesn't help fighting imposter syndrome at all. But my story doesn't end up end here, of course. There were also RSS feeds, uh, newsletters like HTML Weekly, JavaScript Weekly. There were videos from the most recent conferences. And these constantly brought me new information. And I tried to consume all of this information. But in the flow of all of this information, I also had to find time to do real work that paid my bills. So naturally enough, one day I figured out that I don't read those articles anymore. On the best days, I would just glance through the titles, pick two or three, and they would stay opened in my, browsers, in my browser, usually untouched for days. So why did it end up like this? Why didn't I feel myself more competent after consuming all of this information? The answer is, that it was not me who was interested in all this information. It was my imposter syndrome pushing me to learn all these things so that I wouldn't feel myself an incompetent fraud. So what imposter syndrome really does is instead of pushing us to learn new exciting things that we can apply in our work, it leads us to the state of frustration. But those who have ever experienced this feeling, I have good news to, for you. The irony of imposter syndrome is that true frauds seem to rarely experience this feeling. As simple as that. Or as uh, English philosopher Bertrand Russell puts it in a more poetic way, the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. So one interesting thing of imposter syndrome is that we cannot really fight it. We cannot change the situation because nobody can guarantee you that you are competent enough to be in this industry. Nobody can guarantee that you are the smartest in the room. It's impossible. So instead of fighting these things that drive us in, into imposter syndrome, what we have to do is change our attitude to this feeling. And the first thing we have to start with is embrace imposter. 
Pacific Standard Magazine puts this, says this, imposterism is for many people a natural symptom of gaining expertise. And this makes total sense. When we gain expertise, we extend the perimeter of what we know, but at the same time, we expose ourselves to even more of what we don't. So next time you have an attack of imposter syndrome, do not rush to get the new information. Instead, just stop. Stop and enjoy this moment, because most probably, this is the sign of you gaining expertise, you gaining wisdom to realize that there is much more in this world to discover, and there is much more in our industry for us to discover yet. But I deliberately say most probably, because some people confuse stupid bravery to expertise, and this is a completely different story. Another thing I, would tell, I, I could tell you to change our attitude to imposter syndrome is measure yourself with your own yardstick. It's very easy in our industry to be consumed by comparing yourself to others, but this is the game impossible to win. Instead, try comparing yourself to yourself. Compete to yourself. Where were you a year ago, six months ago? Can you see the difference? Can you see this progress? If you can, uh, there was a wonderful talk at the recent Smashing Conference in Barcelona, and uh, Yuko, wonderful illustrator, said, if you look at your past works and they look shit, probably you're on the right track. This is exactly this feeling. Like, if you see that now you're much better than you did a year ago, you're on the right track. And last, but definitely not least, I can tell you, Communicate your fears. This might sound a bit scary, but Neil Gaiman, uh, an acknowledged author of comic books and movies and different books, has a perfect anecdote to soothe anyone with imposter syndrome. Let me read it for you. Some years ago, I was lucky enough to be invited to a gathering of great and good people, artists and scientists, writers and discoverers of things. And I felt that at any moment, they would realize that I didn't qualify to be there among these people who had really done things. On my second or third night there, I was standing at the back of the hall while a musical entertainment happened. And I started talking to a very nice, polite, elderly gentleman about several things, including our shared first name. And then he pointed to the hall of people and said words to the effect of, I just look at all these people what the heck am I doing here? They have made amazing things. I just went where I was sent. And I said, yes, but you were the first man on the moon. I think that counts for something. And I felt a bit better because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. So do not be afraid of communicating your fears. Next time, when you're in the office, and afraid of being found out by your colleagues that you do not know as much as they think you do, tap into the knowledge that probably the people around you might feel inadequate as well. They might have exactly the same feelings, even, even your boss. Because if we do not change our attitude to imposter syndrome, it pushes us to work really hard in order to prove ourselves and then we tend to get into the third bug of our program. That is called as simple as long hours. Let's start with raise of hands. I will ask you three questions. The first one, have you ever worked long hours like developing something or writing CSS or JavaScript uh, or like you work the whole day and then you extend this day and then keep going after midnight or something. How many of you had, have done this at least once? Wonderful. What a stupid question I ask, huh? Okay. How many of you do this on a regular basis? Okay. Now, the main question. How many of you, the day after putting these long hours, like writing CSS after midnight or JavaScript after midnight, realize that the things that were written that late have to be tossed away. They are either buggy or not functioning well, or they completely break the project. Please raise your hand. 
Okay, good. So, long hours are nothing new in our industry, but I have admit that I have never heard of cases of people on the deathbed saying something like, oh God, why was I working so little? Conversely, palliative nurses working with end-to-life care state that one of the most mentioned regrets people say on their deathbeds is that they were working way too much. And again, long hours in our industry is nothing new. From time to time, we just have to put long hours because we have to finish some, something or do some, some really, really urgent work, right? So long hours, per se, are not a bug. There are two different types of long hours, though. Temporary long hours. This is the type of long hours that we usually put when, for example, a new exciting technology is out and we are willing to figure out how this works. So we are willing to put these long hours in order to be smarter, to, be, to understand how this new thing works. Another uh, case, of course, is around deadlines because we all know how good we are with time estimations, aren't we? So this type of long hours is typical for somebody who we would call hardworking developer. But there is another type of long hours that is more permanent. And perfectionism and imposter syndrome as problems set us straight into this category of long hours. This type of long hours is typical for somebody who we would call a workaholic. It's kind of hard to see the difference between hardworking people and workaholics, but I like how uh, Brian Robinson, psychotherapist, puts this. Hardworking people usually have some balance in their life. They might sit at their desks and think about skiing. While workaholics are on the ski slopes thinking about work. Oh. This, this problem in our industry is dictated by our privilege. We are privileged in our industry because we can work from anywhere in the world, anytime, and for some developers, and more so for some employers, this means all the time. But the question is, do we manage to do more during these long hours? Maybe we are more productive. In the beginning of 1920s, an American company conducted the research, including uh, their own employees, and figured out that 20 hours, in addition to the average 40 hours a week, so 60 hours a week in total, indeed leads to increased productivity. 60 hours a week, increased productivity. But it takes only three to four weeks for the productivity, actually, to turn negative. So this research has been conducted by the Ford Motor Company, one of the earliest adopters of 40 hours a week. So as we can see, the fact that we are busy during these long hours doesn't really mean that we are productive during these long hours. Why? Let me introduce you to our friend brain. No matter the unexplored potential of a human brain, in the simplest form, it still behaves like a simple muscle. And when we put long hours as a regular muscle, our brain gets tired. When our brain gets tired, it's prone to making errors. In the world where we crave for perfectionism, where we want to deliver the best possible results. This leads us to mental recursion. It all starts with long hours as an attempt to achieve more, to be more productive. Our brain gets tired and we make errors in our work. When we make errors, we cannot be satisfied with the results, so we lack the feeling of accomplishment. And in order to regain this feeling of accomplishment and re to fix all these problems, again, we put long hours. This mental recursion and long hours, instead of making us more productive, actually leads us to the state of stress. But stress and its heavier forms like burnout are not only about productivity. Karoshi. In Japanese, it technically means death by overwork. According to different resources, in 2015, 10,000 people died in Japan solely due to overwork, 10,000 people. But even then, this term stands nowhere near another term 
gulaosi. That technically means the same, death by overwork, but in Chinese. Every year, China loses about 600,000 people due to overwork. This results to 16 deaths every day due to overwork. We're not talking about people working with sharp objects or guns. Majority of these people are white collars sitting in the offices. In order to understand why stress is so dangerous to us, we have to dive a bit deeper into our friend brain. So when, when we feel stressed, our brain sends signals all over our body to enable the protective mechanism. Among other things, this mechanism consists of two chemicals, adrenaline and the so-called stress hormone cortisol. Combination of this is brilliant. It helps us make really fast decisions when we are in real danger. This combination is very similar to adding important to your CSS files. It overrides everything else. Our body forgets about how to plan our life for the next 10 years because it's busy with thinking how to survive the next 10 minutes. This is what stress does to us. Uh, this mechanism is vital for, our, uh, for, for us to survive, right? And it might even bring this creative adrenaline kick to those hardworking developers to finish that one feature before deadline. But the same mechanism applied for prolonged periods of time to our brain can severely damage our brain. Recent research in Berkeley, California and Sweden show that our brain physically changes its structure under prolonged periods of stress. This is what happens. Amygdala region is increased, thinning of the prefrontal cortex, shrinking of the hippocampus, and the only question we might have here is what the heck does this mean? So let me translate this into human readable language. It means premature aging of your brain, significant drop in learning abilities, and weakened memory. And to make it ridiculously obvious, these three in, co in combination are the signs of mental disability. Isn't it amazing? We do work hard. We want to achieve the best possible result. We learn new things. And the paycheck for all of this is early dementia or Alzheimer's. We have to do something about this. I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with a most common uh, ways to fight stress, like physical exercises or meditation. Simple, as simple things as chocolate or ultraviolet light can help you fight stress a bit. But today I want to talk to you about another approach. Approach that would help you to prevent this um, severe damage to our brains. Let's talk about Harvard. Harvard University, we all know about Harvard, right? It's 133 Nobel laureates, 35 current billionaires, eight presidents of the United States. It's the birthplace for Facebook and Microsoft. It's one of the most selective universities in the world. Uh, in 2017, only 5.8% applicants gained admission to this university. Because in the process of admission, things not directly related to studying are taken into account as well, like uh, achievements in music, achievements in sports, uh, owned uh, startup business, and so on and so on. So it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that anybody studying at Harvard has to live completely crazy life, dedicating every minute of his or her life to either studying or self-development. And a lot of them do. In 2004, there was, it was a meeting between students and the management of the university where students raised some concerns and quite weird concerns, I must say. So some students um, claimed that they want to take two full-size courses, four-year courses, and pass them in parallel. Others wanted to take the full four years course and pass it within three years. So technically, what students wanted was to do as much as they possibly could while they are at Harvard. What a pleasant thing should it be for management of a university to hear these things from the students, right? But instead of being impressed, Harry Lewis, dean of uh, Harvard undergraduate school back then, sent a letter to all the students in Harvard titled, Slow Down, Getting More Out of Harvard by Doing Less. 
In this letter, Harry Lewis appealed to the students that instead of increased mental pressure, what they really need is to slow down. He advocated to, for students to take some time off Harvard, and not just an evening or a week, but take the whole term or the whole year of Harvard. Naturally enough, the parents of the students were furious, reasonably believing that after spending one year off Harvard, students won't be remembering anything they, ha they learned before leaving Harvard, or they just won't be willing to get back to Harvard, right? But statistics tells us 96% of those who had full year off Harvard came back, gained readmission, and successfully graduated Harvard. Harvard calls it this slow learning. Drew Faust, current president of um, Harvard University, says college can help you learn how to think more than what to think. How to think more than what to think. And I believe this is exactly the problem that we have in our industry. We have tons of information telling us what to think, even if it's titled how to. But we have to learn ourselves how to think. Today we have seen that a program presenting an average developer has a lot of bugs. We have covered just the tip of the iceberg. There are many more problems in this program. But unlike our projects, we cannot postpone fixing these bugs for later. Because unlike our projects, this program has no versions other than 1.0. And debugging and fixing problems we have, to do, we have to do it straight in production. Does our industry need more professionally successful developers? Frankly, I don't know. But what is certain is that our industry needs more healthy, more happy developers. My name is Dennis. I'm a developer, and I have a lot of problems because of this. But as psychiatrists say, Acknowledging a problem is the first step to mental health. Today, I have shared some problems that I personally have, but I'm sure they have resonated with some of you. Because even though we're all different, it doesn't mean we cannot have the same problems. Debug, fix problems to your production. Stay healthy, stay happy. Thank you.